I was selected or volunteered to do this by the Gallup Museum, um, not because I was deeply involved in the project, because I was really on the fringes of it, but because I happened to be going on holiday in Spain. Work that one out. Um, and, <laughs> and I'm on the way back, so just taking a day, a day off going home. It's a long way for anyone to come down from Gerlach, west of Ross, to here, mm -hmm. about four and a half hours. So um, I wasn't very deeply involved in the project, and the project really predates, I think, most of that legislation, so it's not <coughs> entirely relevant, but it's, it's an interesting story, I hope. And uh, forgive me for reading this out. This is written in Spain, largely. Um, <laughs> Tough life. Tough yeah, life. I know, it's really hard. It? it was a walking holiday, so it was all good. Right. Um, Gerlach Heritage Museum was founded in 1977 in a former farm study, you can see there, uh, which was leased to, to the Gerlach and District Heritage Society, which had just been formed. Three years later, it was awarded the title of Best Small Museum in Scotland. It is a, it's a lovely museum, and it's very, very popular with those who visit it. The visitor's book is full of positive comments. How many of you have been to it? Ooh, four, five, good, right. It is brilliant. Right. Thank you. <laughs> but, there's a big but, by 2004, it needed to be improved and enlarged. There were several reasons for this. The lease was time limited. It would run out in 2015. The building was now too small for the growing collection. Uh, it was too small for large groups to visit, like bus parties. Uh, and we didn't get enough visitors. It was about 6,000 a year, whereas just down the road, Inverview Garden gets six, 60,000 a year, and we should be matching them, really. Um, the indoor conditions also were unsuitable for collection, the collection. It was an accredited museum, um, but it might lose its accreditation because of the conditions, and so its council funding would also go. As you can see, it's a small, informal, rather chaotic, but rather wonderful collection. So from 2004, a series of reports was produced on different options for the museum. We knew it would have to close or move or do something. Uh, the reports, reports cost £40,000, uh, but half of that came from grants. Three options were considered. Firstly, buying and adding to the setting, but it became obvious that the owner did not, would not want to sell, did not want to sell at all. He refused to sell. We don't know why. <coughs> also, he wouldn't extend the lease. Again, we don't know why. Um, although in the event, he did allow us to stay on until 2018, so the museum wasn't lost completely. Uh, second option was a new build somewhere else. Uh, and various sites were considered but rejected, partly for Island Council planning reasons. Um, thirdly, we could move to an existing building. Imagine that at the museum. That was offered by the local laird. It's a historic uh, barn, but it's a long way from the road, so it's not, well, not really usable. But in 2011, the answer arrived. Highland Council were moving their roads depot from a building in the centre of Gerlach to the quarry outside the village. The reason was something to do with SEPA and road salt. I'm not quite sure of the details. Um, the local paper, Gerlock and District Times, notified us about this and asked for suggestions for making use of the building. All sorts of strange suggestions came up because it's the biggest building you can see in that, that white roof. It's that. <laughs> um, it's certainly the ugliest building in the area. <laughs> and it was called an anti-aircraft operations room, AAOR. 25 meter square, two story concrete block. It has a very sad history. Um, it was known locally, but wrongly, as the radar station. The first part of its history it was built in about 1952. as one of four air defense control centers for Scotland using Second World War methods to guard against Russian bombers. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> um, but at once it was redundant because the technology had advanced, jets had arrived and so on. And it's not clear that it was ever actually manned. In the 1980s, 
It was adapted to be Highland Council's reserve nuclear bunker uh, in case the main one in Inverness failed. Uh, but again, it was soon redundant because the Cold War ended. We found actually in the building a room full of kerosene lamps and another room full of chemical toilets, mostly for use in case the council were sent there. Uh, then thirdly, it became the roads depot uh, for the area, and little care was taken of it by council workers. There was a horrible bungalow in front of it as well, which would have to have to go. Plans to demolish it and build housing on the site founded because it was, it's bomb-proof. And uh, demolition, <laughs> demolition would have cost at least 300,000 pounds or the cost of a very, very large bomb. <laughs> but there was hope for this much abused building. A detailed study and a report showed that it would be ideal for the museum. It's on a central site beside the main road. Excuse me, slipped. All right. Uh, yeah. With lots of parking space, it has a fine view across the sea to sky, which we'll have to imagine in that picture. Uh, it's thermally efficient, thick concrete walls. It will provide a healthy museum environment. And above all, it's big. And Highland Council agreed not to put it on the market, <coughs> but to sell it to us for the magnificent price of one pound. So long as funding could be found. Um, that's, that's not the one pound, but the, <laughs> the cost, cost of the conversion. And if a case could be made for its sustainability and its community benefit. The community benefit case was very strongly made. It would provide employment be a major cultural center for the community. It would be a boost to tourism. It's on an unmissable position beside the North Coast 500 route, which I'm sure you've all heard of. And now it's much busier now on the roads around there. Uh, it could become a kind of partner with Inverview Garden down the road. That's showing the same ticketing or something like that. It should, certainly the numbers should increase. A well-known problem with the NC 500 is the racetrack mentality. People rush past without stopping except at the really major attractions. But Gerlach therefore needs a really major attraction. And our ambition is to set up the biggest and best museum in the Northwest. To sustain it, the business plan includes two rented retail outlets, uh, in addition to the museum shop, a cafe, and space for the Uni University of the Highlands and Islands, UHI. They'll be renting a space in the back of the building. And they're keen supporters of the project. It also be a multi use education room. And the Newton project, if any of you heard of that, might, might be using that. And by the way, a serious blot on the village would be much improved by cladding, creating windows. <coughs> so that's the plan of the building two floors. <coughs> So you cut it, you put some windows in it, only on the front, and do a bit of landscaping around it. And it might look quite good, really. Uh, even so, there were some local museum supporters who were upset by the idea of moving from a small, homely stone building to a large, impersonal, concrete monstrosity. But staying put is not an option. These are some of the architect's thoughts about what it was going to look like, and the, pl the plan of the museum inside. Gerlock and District Heritage Society was by now a limited company for various reasons, uh, with a board of a dozen volunteers. And to manage the project, board members and outside specialists were formed into five project groups covering museum and heritage, project development, building, business and finance, and community fundraising. This worked pretty well, although there was some flexibility between groups. Five people played really important roles, and for any project like this, I think you need these. The chairman, who was a former county councillor with many contacts. The secretary, who was really hard working and very good at dealing with bureaucracy. The full-time curator, a one full-time job, who was assisted by two 
short-term project curators at different times, paid for by special grants. The project manager, who is uh, Mia, who is the director of Highland Bill Buildings Preserva Preservation Trust, based in Inverness. Um, and she has worked for us on very favorable terms. And then LDN Architects in Edinburgh, who really believed in the project and started working on it before they were paid for it. The cost of, was first estimated at just over two million pounds, the cost of converting the building into that. Uh, that went up gradually and is now sometime, somewhere around 2.4 million pounds. That included allowances for inflation and the unexpected. In 2013, an application was made to Heritage Lottery Fund for about £700,000, about a third. This application failed. But their feedback was positive and encouraged us to make a revised application. Importantly, at this point, Highlands and Islands Enterprise weighed in on our side and said they wanted the projects to succeed. HLF were the, 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 were the big funder. We needed to unlock funds from other sources. Although they've provided less than a third of the cost, they've taken charge of the project, forcing us to understand their bureaucracy, fill in all their forms, attend their meetings, and pass through their various compulsory stages. They're not easy to work with. And the mentor who was appointed to look after our bid made things harder by his very negative attitude. <laughs> Sadly. However, a second application was made in 2014 and it succeeded. Sorry. That's the site as envisaged by the architect. And here we are, Heritage Lottery. So we had to raise the other two thirds of the funding. A huge effort was put in. And by mid 2017, by now, almost all of the money has been found from a wide and very varied collection of sources, each of them needing a different kind of approach and working by different rules. They included HLF itself, 725,600 pounds. I'm not sure why the 600 comes from. But the Scottish Government Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. That doesn't make a very really good acronym, does it? Uh, 350,000 pounds. The Vacant and Derelict Land Fund, £95,000, that's also the Scottish Government. Islands and Islands Enterprise, I don't have that figure, I think it's 200000 certainly more than 150000 European Leader Fund, uh, haven't yet paid, because we have to own the building before they will pay their money. And I think we've just bought it now. Uh, but that, I think, £175,000 we've asked for, don't yet. No, for sure, getting it. We <coughs> came to the Gallery of Scot Scotland, £40,000 for a learning and interpretation officer. A lot of private trusts, and Mia and our sec own secretary and curator were working on all the trusts in Britain that they could find, or anything likely to give any money. And the big ones, like the Garfield Western Fund, the Trust, the Gordon and Eva Baxter Trust, the Wolfson Trust, the Radcliffe Trust, uh, added well over £100,000. And then there are lots of other miscellaneous bodies, such as Scottish and Southern Electricity. We tried the banks, but they wouldn't give anything. <laughs> then it was agreed that £200,000 would be raised locally. It's about 10%. So a community of 1,000, in fact a parish of 2,000, had to try and raise £200,000. And we've done it. Um, um, various methods. The mailing list was developed and letters sent out asking for pledges. Leaflets were delivered by hand to most of the area. There was a major auction preceded by a valuation day, and we had an auctioneer from Bonhams who volunteered to come and do that for us. There was a series of pub quizzes, very popular, a caning, a grand raffle, a pottery making course, garden openings, and so on, a series of events. There was a series of pub, uh, sorry, I've done that one. Two local books were published and sold well, a recipe book and a photographic book. Matched funding of up to £40,000 came from a local benefactor. There was even, a, still going I think, a last minute crowdfunding scheme in connection with the Outlander TV series. 
Uh, the reason being that the, apparently the Gaelic dialect they use in that is the Gaelic Gaelic dialect. That has raised very little. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a thermometer set up outside the museum, one of the big painted thermometers to uh, record progress. Where have I got to the pictures? That's the sort of leaflet we um, sent around the community um, to people picking up in the museum. I have got that there, I'm not sure. Right. Anyway, that's, that's probably our biggest, one of, one of our biggest assets, is this huge Fresnel lens from the lighthouse along the road. It's been, so, sorry, it's been far from a smooth journey. Minor issues have included whether to register for VAT or not. We obviously do, because then you get VAT back on the building. The need for a bridging loan. Some funders pay in advance, others only after completion. Uh, a series of hurdles one has to jump before HLF will give final permission to start, which they've now done. The question of when to pay the one pound and commit ourselves to owning the building, and that's just happened. Uh, the council's refusal, until we owned it, to let us into the building without one of their men present. It's crazy and very awkward. The need to test for asbestos twice. I don't remember why that was, but we done that twice. Um, only the efficiency and efforts of the project leaders have taken us this far. It's been a long distance hurdles race, I would say, uh, but we're almost there. Building tenders have been received and inevitably are over our budget and are so being negotiated downwards. We might have to make a few small sacrifices in the design. Building should start in January. Work on the museum displays has started already uh, and helped by the specialist designers Campbell and Co. in Edinburgh. And I've been fighting a few battles with them about the nature of the displays. Um, the hope is that the new Gerlach Museum will open in spring 2019. Come and see it. But first check out that it has actually opened. <laughs> <laughs> so that's from the old the new. Right. Thank you.